Recording by Matthew Hinman Chapter 24 War Five miles out at sea from Port Royal, whence the details of the coast of Jamaica were losing their sharpness, the Arabella hove to, and the sloop she had been towing was warped alongside. Captain Blood escorted his compulsory guest to the head of the ladder. Colonel Bishop, who for two hours and more had been in a state of mortal anxiety, breathed freely at last, and as the tide of his fears receded, so that of his deep-rooted hate of this audacious buccaneer resumed its normal flow. But he practiced circumspection. If in his heart he vowed that once back in Port Royal there was no effort he would spare, no nerve he would not strain, to bring Peter Blood to final moorings in execution dock, at least he kept that vow strictly to himself. Peter Blood had no illusions. He was not and never would be the complete pirate. There was not another buccaneer in all the Caribbean who would have denied himself the pleasure of stringing Colonel Bishop from the yardarm, and by thus finally stifling the vindictive planter's hatred have increased his own security. But Blood was not of these. Moreover, in the case of Colonel Bishop, there was a particular reason for restraint, because he was Arabella Bishop's uncle. His life must remain sacred to Captain Blood. And so the captain smiled into the sallow, bloated face, and the little eyes that fixed him with a malevolence not to be dissembled. "'A safe voyage home to you, Colonel, darling,' said he in valediction, and from his easy, smiling manner you would never have dreamt of the pain he carried in his breast. "'It's the second time you've served me for a hostage. Ye'll be well advised to avoid a third. I'm not lucky to you, Colonel, as you should be perceiving.' Jeremy Pitt, the master lounging at Blood's elbow, looked darkly upon the departure of the deputy governor. Behind them a little mob of grim, stalwart, suntan buccaneers were restrained from cracking Bishop like a flea only by their submission to the dominant will of their leader. They had learned from Pitt while yet in Port Royal of their captain's danger, and whilst as ready as he to throw over the king's service which had been thrust upon them, yet they resented the matter in which this had been rendered necessary, and they marveled now at Blood's restraint where Bishop was concerned. The deputy governor looked round and met the lowering hostile glances of those fierce eyes. Instinct warned him that his life at that moment was held precariously, that an injudicious word might precipitate an explosion of hatred from which no human power could save him. Therefore he said nothing. He inclined his head in silence to the captain and went blundering and stumbling in his haste down that ladder to the sloop and its waiting negro crew. They pushed off the craft from the red hull of the Arabella, bent to their sweeps, then, hoisting sail, headed back for Port Royal, intent upon reaching it before darkness should come down upon them. And Bishop, the great bulk of him huddled in the stem sheets, sat silent, his black brows knitted, his coarse lips pursed, malevolence and vindictiveness so whelming now, his recent panic that he forgot his near escape of the yardarm and the running noose. On the mole at Port Royal, under the low, embattled wall of the fort, Major Mallard and Lord Julian waited to receive him, and it was with infinite relief that they assisted him from the sloop. Major Mallard was disposed to be apologetic. "'Glad to see you safe, sir,' said he. "'I'd have sunk blood ship, in spite of your excellency's being aboard, but for your own orders by Lord Julian, and his lordship's assurance that he had blood's word for it, that no harm should come to you, so that no harm came to him. I'll confess I thought it rash of his lordship to accept the word of a damned pirate. I have found it as good as another's, said his lordship, cropping the major's too eager eloquence. He spoke with an unusual degree of that frosty dignity he could assume upon occasion. The fact is that his lordship was in an exceedingly bad humor. Having written jubilantly home to the Secretary of State that his mission had succeeded, he was now faced with the necessity of writing again, to confess that this success had been ephemeral. And because Major Mallard's crisp mustachios were lifted by a sneer, 
at the notion of a buccaneer's word being acceptable. He added still more sharply, My justification is here in the person of Colonel Bishop safely returned. As against that, sir, your opinion does not weigh for very much. You should realize it. Oh, as your lordship says, Major Mallard's manner was tinged with irony. To be sure, here is the colonel safe and sound, and out yonder is Captain Blood, also safe and sound, to begin his piratical ravages all over again. I do not propose to discuss the reasons with you, Major Mallard. And anyway, it's not for long, growled the colonel, finding speech at last. No, by... He emphasized the assurance of an unprintable oath. If I spend the last shilling of my fortune and the last ship of the Jamaica fleet, I'll have that rascal in a hempen necktie before I rest, and I'll not be long about it. He had empurpled in his angry vehemence, and the veins of his forehead stood out like whipcord. Then he checked. You did well to follow Lord Julian's instructions, he commended the Major. With that he turned from him and took his lordship by the arm. Come, my lord, we must take order about this, you and I. They went off together, skirting the redoubt, and so through courtyard and garden to the house where Arabella waited anxiously. The sight of her uncle brought her infinite relief, not only on his account but on account also of Captain Blood. You took a great risk, sir, she gravely told Lord Julian, after the ordinary greetings had been exchanged. But Lord Julian answered her, as he had answered Major Mallard. There was no risk, ma'am. She looked at him in some astonishment. His long, aristocratic face wore a more melancholy, pensive air than usual. He answered the inquiry in her glance. So that Blood's ship were allowed to pass the fort, no harm could come to Colonel Bishop. Blood pledged me his word for that. A faint smile broke the set of her lips, which hitherto had been wistful, and a little color tinged her cheeks. She would have pursued the subject, but the deputy governor's mood did not permit it. He sneered and snorted at the notion of Blood's word being good for anything, forgetting that he owed it to his own preservation at that moment. At supper, and for long thereafter, he talked of nothing but blood, of how he would lay him by the heels and what hideous things he would perform upon his body. As he drank heavily the while, his speech became increasingly gross and his threats increasingly horrible, until in the end Arabella withdrew, white-faced and almost on the verge of tears. It was not often that Bishop revealed himself to his niece. Oddly enough, this coarse, overbearing planter went in a certain awe of that slim girl. It was as if she had inherited from her father the respect in which he had always been held by his brother. Lord Julian, who began to find Bishop disgusting beyond endurance, excused himself soon after and went in quest of the lady. He had yet to deliver the message from Captain Blood, and this, he thought, would be his opportunity. But Miss Bishop had retired for the night, and Lord Julian must curb his impatience, it amounted by now to nothing less, until the morrow. Very early next morning, before the heat of day came to render the open intolerable to his lordship, he espied her from his window moving amid the azaleas in the garden. It was a fitting setting for one who was still as much a delightful novelty to him in womanhood as was the azalea among flowers. He hurried forth to join her, and when, aroused from her pensiveness, she had given him a good morrow, smiling and frank, he explained himself by the announcement that he bore her a message from Captain Blood. He observed her little start and the slight quiver of her lips, and observed thereafter not only her pallor and the shadowy rings about her eyes, but also that unusually wistful air which last night had escaped his notice. They moved out of the open to one of the terraces, where a pergola of orange trees provided a shaded sauntering space that was at once cool and fragrant. As they went, he considered her admiringly, and marveled at himself that it should have taken him so long to fully realize her slim, unusual grace, and to find her, as he now did, so entirely desirable, a woman whose charm must irradiate all the life of a man, 
and touch his commonplaces into magic. He noted the sheen of her red-brown hair, and how gracefully one of its heavy ringlets coiled upon her slender, milk-white neck. She wore a gown of shimmering gray silk, and a scarlet rose, fresh gathered, was pinned at her breast like a splash of blood. Always thereafter, when he thought of her, it was as he saw her at that moment, as never, I think, until that moment had he seen her. In silence they paced on a little way into the green shade. Then she paused and faced him. "'You said something of a message, sir,' she reminded him, thus betraying some of her impatience. He fingered the ringlets of his periwig, a little embarrassed how to deliver himself, considering how he should begin. "'He desired me,' he said at last, "'to give you a message that should prove to you that there is still something left in him of the unfortunate gentleman that—that that for which once you knew him. That is not now necessary, she said very gravely. He misunderstood her, of course, knowing nothing of the enlightenment that yesterday had come to her. I think, nay, I know that you do him an injustice, said he. Her hazel eyes continued to regard him. If you will deliver the message, it may enable me to judge. To him this was confusing. He did not immediately answer. He found that he had not sufficiently considered the terms he should employ, and the matter, after all, was of an exceeding delicacy, demanding delicate handling. It was not so much that he was concerned to deliver a message, as to render it a vehicle by which to plead his own cause. Lord Julian, well versed in the lore of womankind, and usually at his ease with ladies of the Beaumont, found himself oddly constrained before this frank and unsophisticated niece of a colonial planter. They moved on in silence, and as if by common consent toward the brilliant sunshine where the pergola was intersected by the avenue leading upwards to the house. Across this patch of light fluttered a gorgeous butterfly that was like black and scarlet velvet and large as a man's hand. His lordship's brooding eyes followed it out of sight before he answered. "'It is not easy. Stab me, it is not. He was a man who deserved well, and amongst us we have marred his chances. Your uncle, because he could not forget his rancor. You, because having told him that in the king's service he would find his redemption of what was past, you would not afterwards admit to him that he was so redeemed.' and this, although concerned to rescue you, was the chief motive of his embracing that same service. She had turned her shoulder to him so that he should not see her face. I know, I know now, she said softly. Then after a pause, she added the question, And you, what part has your lordship had in this, that you should incriminate yourself with us? My part? Again he hesitated then plunged recklessly on as men do when determined to perform a thing they fear. If I understood him aright, and if he understood aright himself, my part, though entirely passive, was none the less effective. I implore you to observe that I but report his own words. I say nothing for myself. His lordship's unusual nervousness was steadily increasing. He thought then, so he told me, that my presence here had contributed to his inability to redeem himself in your sight, and unless he were so redeemed, then there was redemption nothing. She faced him fully, a frown of perplexity bringing her eyebrows together above her troubled eyes. He thought that you had contributed? she echoed. It was clear she asked for enlightenment. He plunged on to afford it to her, his glance a little scared, his cheeks flushing. Aye, and he said so in terms which told me something that I hope above all things, and yet dare not believe. For God knows I am no coxcomb, Arabella. He said, but first let me tell you how it was placed. I had gone aboard his ship to demand the instant surrender of your uncle whom he held captive. He laughed at me. Colonel Bishop should be a hostage for his safety. By rashly venturing aboard his ship, I afforded him in my own person yet another hostage, as valuable, at least, as Colonel Bishop. Yet he bade me depart, not from the fear of consequences, for he is above fear, 
nor from any personal esteem for me, whom he confessed that he had come to find detestable, and this for the very reason that made him concerned for my safety. I do not understand, she said, as he paused. Is that not a contradiction in itself? It seems so only. The fact is, Arabella, this unfortunate man has the the temerity to love you. She cried out at that, and clutched her breast, whose calm was suddenly disturbed. Her eyes dilated as she stared at him. I, I've startled you, said he with concern. I feared I should, but it was necessary so that you may understand. Go on, she bade him. Well, then, he saw in me one who made it impossible that he should win you, so he said. Therefore he could with satisfaction have killed me. But because my death might cause you pain, because your happiness was the thing that above all things he desired, he surrendered that part of his guarantee of safety which my person afforded him. If his departure should be hindered, and I should lose my life in what might follow, there was the risk that, that you might mourn me. That risk he would not take. Him you deemed a thief and a pirate, he said, and added that, I am giving you his own words, always, if in choosing between us two your choice, as he believed, would fall on me, then were you in his opinion choosing wisely. Because of that, he bade me leave his ship, and had me put ashore. She looked at him with eyes that were aswim with tears. He took a step towards her, a catch in his breath, his hand held out. Was he right, Arabella? My life's happiness hangs upon your answer. But she continued silently to regard him with those tear-laden eyes, without speaking, and until she spoke he dared not advance farther. A doubt, a tormenting doubt beset him. When presently she spoke, he saw how true had been the instinct of which that doubt was born. For her words revealed the fact that of all that he had said, the only thing that had touched her consciousness and absorbed it from all other considerations was Blood's conduct as it regarded herself. He said that? she cried. He did that? Oh! She turned away and through the slender, clustering trunks of the bordering orange trees, she looked out across the glittering waters of the great harbor to the distant hills. Thus for a little while my lord standing stiffly, fearfully, waiting for fuller revelation of her mind. At last it came, slowly, deliberately, in a voice that at moments was half suffocated. Last night when my uncle displayed his rancor and his evil rage, it began to be borne in upon me that such vindictiveness can belong only to those who have wronged. It is the frenzy into which men whip themselves to justify an evil passion. I must have known then, if I had not already learnt it, that I had been too credulous of all the unspeakable things attributed to Peter Blood. Yesterday I had his own explanation of that tale of Levasseur that you heard at St. Nicholas. And now this— this but gives me confirmation of his truth and worth. To a scoundrel, such as I, was too readily brought to believe him, the act of which you have just told me would have been impossible. That is my own opinion, said his lordship gently. It must be, but even if it were not, that would now weigh for nothing. What weighs, oh, so heavily and bitterly, is the thought that but for the words in which yesterday I repelled him, he might have been saved. If only I could have spoken to him again before he went. I waited for him, but my uncle was with him, and I had no suspicion that he was going away again. And now he is lost, back at his outlawry and piracy in which ultimately he will be taken and destroyed. And the fault is mine. Mine! What are you saying? The only agents were your uncle's hostility and his own obstinacy, which would not steady compromise. You must not blame yourself for anything. She swung to him with some impatience, her eyes a swim in tears. 
you can say that in spite of this message which in itself tells how much i was to blame it was my treatment of him the epithets i cast at him that drove him so much he has told you i know it to be true you have no cause for shame said he as for your sorrow why if it will afford you solace you may still count on me to do what man can to rescue him from this position she caught her breath you will do that she cried with sudden eager hopefulness you promise she held out her hand to him impulsively he took it in both his own i promise he answered her and then retaining still the hand she had surrendered to him arabella he said very gently there is still this other matter upon which you have not answered me this other matter was he mad she wondered could any other matter signify in such a moment this matter that concerns myself and all my future oh so very closely this thing that blood believed that prompted him that that you are not indifferent to me he saw the fair face change color and grow troubled once more indifferent to you said she why no we have been good friends we shall continue so i hope my lord friends good friends he was between dismay and bitterness it is not your friendship only that i ask arabella you heard what i said what i reported you will not say that peter blood was wrong gently she sought to disengage her hand the trouble in her face increasing a moment he resisted then realizing what he did he set her free arabella he cried on a note of sudden pain i have friendship for you my lord but only friendship his castle of hopes came clattering down about him leaving him a little stunned as he had said he was no coxcomb yet there was something that he did not understand she confessed to friendship and it was in his power to offer her a great position one to which she a colonial planter's niece however wealthy could never have aspired even in her dreams this she rejected yet spoke of friendship peter blood had been mistaken then how far had he been mistaken had he been as mistaken in her feelings toward himself as he obviously was in her feelings toward his lordship in that case his reflections broke short to speculate was to wound himself in vain he must know therefore he asked her with grim frankness is it peter blood peter blood she echoed at first she did not understand the purport of his question when understanding came a flush suffused her face i do not know she said faltering a little this was hardly a truthful answer for as if an obscuring veil had been suddenly rent that morning she was permitted at last to see peter blood in his true relations to other men and that sight vouchsafed her twenty-four hours too late filled her with pity and regret and yearning lord julian knew enough of women to be left in no further doubt he bowed his head so that she might not see the anger in his eyes for as a man of honour he took shame in that anger which as a human being he could not repress and because nature in him was stronger as it is in most of us than training lord julian from that moment began almost in spite of himself to practise something that was akin to villainy i regret to chronicle it of one for whom if i have done him any sort of justice you should have been conceiving some esteem but the truth is that the lingering remains of the regard in which he had held peter blood were choked by the desire to supplant and destroy a rival he had passed his word to arabella that he would use his powerful influence on blood's behalf i deplore to set it down that not only did he forget his pledge but secretly set himself to aid and abet arabella's uncle in the plans he laid for the trapping and undoing of the buccaneer he might reasonably have urged had he been taxed with it that he conducted himself precisely as his duty demanded but to that he might have been answered that duty with him was but the slave of jealousy in this 
when the jamaica fleet put to sea some few days later lord julian sailed with colonel bishop in vice admiral crawford's flagship not only was there need for either of them to go but the deputy governor's duties actually demanded that he should remain ashore whilst lord julian as we know was a useless man aboard a ship yet both set out to hunt captain blood each making of his duty a pretext for the satisfaction of personal aims and that common purpose became a link between them binding them in a sort of friendship that must otherwise have been impossible between men so dissimilar in breeding and in aspirations the hunt was up they cruised a while off hispaniola watching the windward passage and suffering the discomforts of the rainy season which had now set in but they cruised in vain and after a month of it returned empty-handed to port royal there to find awaiting them the most disquieting news from the old world the megalomania of louis the fourteenth had set europe in a blaze of war the french legionnaires were ravaging the rhine provinces and spain had joined the nations leagued to defend themselves from the wild ambitions of the king of france and there was worse than this there were rumors of civil war in england where the people had grown weary of the bigoted tyranny of king james it was reported that William of Orange had been invited to come over. Weeks passed, and every ship from home brought additional news. William had crossed to England, and in March of that year, 1689, they learned in Jamaica that he had accepted the crown, and that James had thrown himself into the arms of France for rehabilitation. To a kinsman of Sunderland's, this was disquieting news indeed. It was followed by letters from King William's Secretary of State informing Colonel Bishop that there was war with France, and that in view of its effect upon the colonies, a Governor-General was coming out to the West Indies in the person of Lord Willoughby, and that with him came a squadron under the command of Admiral van der Kuylen to reinforce the Jamaica fleet against eventualities. Bishop realized that this must mean the end of his supreme authority, even though he should continue in Port Royal as deputy governor. Lord Julian, in the lack of direct news to himself, did not know what it might mean to him, but he had been very close and confidential with Colonel Bishop regarding his hopes of Arabella, and Colonel Bishop more than ever, now that political events put him in danger of being retired, was anxious to enjoy the advantages of having a man of Lord Julian's eminence for his relative." they came to a complete understanding in the matter, and Lord Julian disclosed all that he knew. "'There is one obstacle in our path,' said he. "'Captain Blood. The girl is in love with him.' "'You're surely mad,' cried Bishop, when he had recovered speech. "'You are justified of the assumption,' said his lordship dolefully. "'But I happen to be sane and to speak with knowledge.' "'With knowledge?' Arabella herself has confessed it to me. The brazen baggage! By God, I'll bring her to her senses! It was the slave-driver speaking, the man who governed with a whip. Don't be a fool, Bishop! His lordship's contempt did more than any argument to call him the colonel. That's not the way with a girl of Arabella's spirit. Unless you want to wreck my chances for all time, you'll hold your tongue and not interfere at all. Not interfere? my god what then listen man she has a constant mind i don't think you know your niece as long as blood lives she will wait for him then with blood dead perhaps she will come to her silly senses now you begin to show intelligence lord julian commended him that is the first essential step and here is our chance to take it bishop warmed to a sort of enthusiasm this war with France removes all restrictions in the matter of Tortuga. We are free to invest it in the service of the crown. A victory there, and we establish ourselves in the favor of this new government. Ah, said Lord Julian, and pulled thoughtfully at his lip. I see that you understand, Bishop laughed coarsely. Two birds with one stone, eh? We'll hunt this rascal in his lair right under the beard of the King of France, and we'll take him this time if we reduce Tortuga to a heap of ashes. On that expedition they sailed two days later, which would be some three months after Blood's departure, taking every ship of the fleet and several lesser vessels as auxiliaries. To Arabella and the world in general, 
it was given out that they were going to raid French Hispaniola, which was really the only expedition that could have afforded Colonel Bishop any sort of justification for leaving Jamaica at all at such a time. His sense of duty, indeed, should have kept him fast in Port Royal, but his sense of duty was smothered in hatred, that most fruitless and corruptive of all the emotions. In the great cabin of Vice Admiral Crawford's flagship, the Imperator, the Deputy Governor got drunk that night to celebrate his conviction that the sands of Captain Blood's career were running out. End of chapter 24